الحمد لله رب العالمين الصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والعصر إن الإنسان لفي خسر إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواسوا بالحق وتواسوا بالصبر إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد ربي شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل لغدة من لساني يفقه قولي ربي زدني علما وارزقنا فهما وجعلنا من الراشدين سبحان الله وبحمده عدد خلقه ورضاء نفسه وزنة عرشه ومداد كلماته Alhamdulillah wa shukrillah wa thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for allowing us to gather here for his remembrance for the remembrance of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and those that uh, followed in his way week on week alhamdulillah we're in the month of Rajab and uh, reminding ourselves of the qualities and the benefits and the merits of Rajab the lessons that we learn through this month that this is the month the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to make extensive dua Allahumma barik lana Rajab wa Sha'ban وَبَلِّغْنَا رَمَضَانِ O oh Allah, bless us in the month of Rajab and Shaban. Allow us to reach the month of Ramadan, to see the month of Ramadan. This is the month in which our preparation for Ramadan begins. Today we are already, inshallah, will be entering into the 27th night, which is the night of Mi'raj, Laylatul Mi'raj of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa And this is what the previous discourses have been about as well, that what lessons can we learn from the Mi'raj. And it is so important, it is vital that we do not waste this time. And the month has already passed and unfortunately people have still not begun. We have still not begun our efforts in our preparation towards the month of Ramadan. The seeds that needed to be planted have not been planted. The istighfar that was supposed to be done has not been done. Turning back to Allah, putting our matters right, paying our zakat has not been done. And then again we will enter into the month of Ramadan and we will wonder why we did not fully gain the benefits of the month. We will feel the change, we will feel the difference, we will feel the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but we will not be practicing at our optimum level. We all make that intention, inshallah, I'm going to be waking up for the hajjud, I'm going to be reading extra nawafil, I'm going to be doing this, I'm going to be doing that. But Ramadan will come, Ramadan will go, and you will still be saying, tomorrow I'll do this, tomorrow I'll do this, tomorrow I'll do this. Okay, at the end of Ramadan you'll say, you know what, next Ramadan I'm, I'm, I'm going to make sure it's not going to happen again. No. We have next few days, inshallah, of Rajab, we increase in our istighfar. We increase in our istighfar, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us the full blessing of what Rajab was supposed to bring upon us. So we take that benefit and then we move forward with it. And it is so important, again, that we reflect even on the night, on the story of the month of Rajab. Very important. It is very important the how the Prophet ﷺ traveled from Mecca to Jerusalem, from Jerusalem, went up past the heavens, and where he had the ziyara of all the heavens and the hellfire and the inhabitants of them. To the point where he got to the low tree, Sidratul Muntaha, from there he went up and met Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So inshallah today what I wanted to do was I wanted to read a few excerpts from the journey itself. It is important for all of you to go and find a reliable source text to go and read what the, what the uh, Isra wal Miraj was about. And like we said last week, Isra, the, the night journey is called Isra wal Miraj. Isra and Miraj. Isra was the physical journey that took place from Mecca to Jerusalem. Mi'raj was the ascension itself. Okay? Mi'raj, the word also comes from Uruj, which is, you know, to uh, elevate. And this was an elevation in, in a sense, not just for the Prophet ﷺ, but for all the creation that witnessed the Prophet ﷺ on that night. So inshallah, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the ability to implement changes that will benefit us, not only in this life, but in the hereafter. 
This is the Prophet's night journey and heavenly ascent by Sayyid Muhammad ibn Alawi al Maliki. He was a Sayyid in, who used to teach in the Haram in Makkah. And uh, mashallah, what a beautiful man they were. Um, we had the honor of meeting them in 2003. And he granted a lot of gifts as well at that time. But he was someone so special. And it, mashallah, it is his collection of all the hadith put into a sequence so that it flows as a full story. Because the hadith relating to the Mi'raj are all in bits and pieces from different sahabas. So what they did was they put them all together in a sequence as ulama in the past have been doing as well. So inshallah we will read some of it um, and then inshallah we, what we will do is we will try and understand some of those things that um, may be of a lesson to us. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. The Prophet ﷺ then felt the greatest thirst that he had ever felt whereupon Jibreel ﷺ brought him a vessel of wine and a vessel of milk. He chose the milk. Jibreel ﷺ said, you have chosen the fitra, the natural disposition. Had you chosen to drink the wine, your community would have strayed from the right way and none but a few of them would have followed you. Another narration states that there were three vessels, the third containing water, Jibreel said that if you had drunk the water, your community would have perished by drowning. Another narration states that one of the vessels presented to him contained honey instead of water, and that he then saw the wide-eyed maidens of paradise at the left of the rock. He greeted them, and they returned his greeting. Then he asked them something, and they replied with an answer that cools the eyes. Then the Prophet ﷺ was brought the ladder by which the spirits of the children of Adam ascend. Creation never saw a more beautiful object. It had alternate stairs of silver and gold and came down from the highest and amplest garden of, Jan of paradise, Jannat al -Firdaus. It was encrusted with pearls and surrounded with angels on its right and left. The Prophet ﷺ began his ascent with Jibreel ﷺ until they reached one of the gates of the nearest heaven called Bab al -Hafadah. There the angel stood guard named Ismail ﷺ who is the custodian of the nearest heaven. He inhabits the wind. He never ascended to the heaven nor descended to earth except on the day that the Prophet ﷺ passed away. In front of him stood 70,000 angels, each angel commanding an army of 70,000 more. Jibreel ﷺ asked for the gate to be opened. Someone said, Who is this? He said, Jibreel, who is with you? Muhammad ﷺ. Has he been sent for? Yes. Welcome to him from his family. May Allah grant him a long life, a brother and a deputy. And what an excellent brother and deputy, what an excellent visit this is. The gate was opened. When they came in, they saw Adam alayhi salam, the father of humanity. Just as he was on the very day Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created him in his complete form. The spirits of the prophets and of his faithful offspring were being shown to him. Whereupon he would say, a goodly spirit and a goodly soul. Put it in the highest, in the illiyin. Then the spirits of his disbelieving offspring were shown to him, and he would say, a foul spirit and a foul soul. Put it in the lowest layer of hell, in the sijin. The Prophet wasallam saw on Adam salam's right, great dark masses and a great exuding, and, uh, and a gate exuding a fragrant smell. And on his left, great dark masses and a ga gate exuding a foul putrid smell. Whenever Adam salam looked to his right, he would smile and be happy. And whenever he looked to his left, he would be sad and weep. The Prophet ﷺ greeted him and Adam salam returned his greeting and said, Welcome to the righteous son and the righteous prophet. The Prophet ﷺ said, What is this, O Jibreel? He replied, This is your father Adam salam and the dark throngs of the souls of, are the souls of his children. Those on the right are the people of paradise and those on the left are the people of the fire. Whenever he looks to his right, he smiles and he is glad. And whenever he looks to his left, he is sad and weeps. The door to his right is the gate of paradise. Whenever he sees those of his offspring enter, he smiles happily. The door to his left is the gate of hellfire. Whenever he sees one of his offspring enters it, he weeps sadly. Ashami added that then the Prophet ﷺ continued for a little while. He saw a table spread in which there were good pieces of meat which no one approached, and another table spread in which there were pieces of rotten meat, 
which stank, surrounded by people who were eating it. The Prophet ﷺ asked, Oh Jibreel, who are these? He replied, These are those of your ummah who abandon what is lawful and proceed to what is unlawful. Allah. The Prophet ﷺ in another narration saw a great deal of people gathered around a table spread in which was set grilled meat of the best kind one has ever seen. Near the table there was some carrion decaying, a dead body. The people were coming to the carrion to eat from it and they were leaving the grilled meat untouched. The Prophet ﷺ asked, Who are they, O Jibreel? He replied, The adulterers. They make lawful what Allah has made unlawful and they abandon what Allah has made lawful for them. And this is something, subhanAllah, we need to take into account. This is a lesson now for us. These are lessons because these are the people the Prophet ﷺ has seen on his journey in Miraj. Although he has entered the, the stage into paradise, but he was being shown of those that were going to enter the fire, who and what these people were. And these were the people who left their wives who are halal for them and went to those other women who are not. So they left the good meat and they went to that which was rotten and smelling and had gone bad. And this is the similitude that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is showing us. And this is something that we need to be very careful about. That what we leave, what halal, what good there is, we leave and we turn to that which is haram. Then the Prophet ﷺ went on for a little while. He saw groups of people who had bellies as large as houses. And there were snakes in them which could be seen through their skins. Every time one of those people stood up, he would fall again and he would say, Oh Allah, don't make the hour of judgment rise yet. Then they meet the people of Fir'aun on the road and the latter trample them underfoot. The Prophet ﷺ said, I heard them clamoring to Allah. He asked, Oh Jibreel, who are these? He replied, they are those of your ummah who used to eat riba, who used to indulge in interest. These people on the day of Qiyamah and in the hereafter, they will have bellies as big as houses. And they will be filled with scorpions and snakes, biting them and biting them and biting them and biting them. That's all it is. Why? Because they transacted in usury, in interest. <coughs> Money that was unearned. They gave someone a thousand pounds and said, we want a thousand one hundred back. We want one thousand and fifty back. And for this, a punishment awaits for these if people. Oh Allah, yeah, they cannot stand up except in the manner of those whom shaitan touches with possession. Then the Prophet ﷺ went on for a little while. He saw groups of people whose lips resembled the lips of camels. Their mouths were being pried open and they would be stoned. One version says a rock from the hellfire was placed in their mouths and then it would come out again from there behind. The Prophet ﷺ said, I heard them clamoring to Allah. He asked, O oh Jibreel, who are these? He replied, they are those of your ummah who eat up the property of orphans and commit injustice. They are eating nothing but the fire for their bellies and they shall be roasted in it. So everything that we take that does not belong to us in this life, there is a price to pay for it. If you look at the first one, the first point that we had made about the meat being the halal and non-halal, that is simply about restraining your gaze, about restraining your hands, restraining your feet from going to these people, and also restraining your private parts. All the sins that we have talked about here are all to do with your jism, to do with your body. Usury is what? Of the hands, it is of the tongue making the deal signing the papers, eating it and filling your bellies with that which is haram. Again, it is to do with your jism. It is to do with your body because it was not purified. The people whose lips resemble the lips of camels, they were sticking out. And 
rocks from the fire of hell were being put into their mouths, they would burn all the way through to their backsides and leave them. And this would be repeated again and again and again. And who are these? Who eat up the property of others. And today we look in our communities, someone has taken one inch of my land, or someone has taken two inches of my land. This land never belonged to you. What's going to happen to these people? What is going to happen to the people who are fighting over the most minute and the worst of things? Does the person taking it think that they are going to become that much wealthier? Do they think that that extra amount of land that they are going to steal off someone else, help them in their qabr, that same ground is going to open up for them to go inside? What's going on? Who is being fooled? How many days do we have on this, on, this, on this land, on this earth? A matter of days. A matter of days. And again, what is it? It's greed. What is it? It's love of dunya, love of name and fame, love of power. This is what our deen is teaching us, that we need to remove ourselves from this. We do not leave the world. The world has to be taken out of us. This is why we need a teacher who has walked the spiritual path, who can actually teach us to get out of this. Instruction has been given. Instruction has been given, but the application is lacking. Then the Prophet ﷺ went on for a little while. He saw women suspended by their breasts and others hanging upside down. The Prophet ﷺ said, I heard them screaming and crying to Allah. He asked, Who are these, O Jibreel? He replied, These are the women who commit fornication and those that used to kill their children. Unnecessary abortions. Fornication. Something that is rife within our community. At every level. Every level. It is not the person only that commits the act. It is the person that even looking in a bad way is fornication of the eyes. The touching is fornication of the hands. Walking towards is fornication of the feet. In every aspect and in every regard. And this as men sitting here talking, we, are, um, we need to be careful of what our eyes befall. But for you as men of the, in the family, need to make sure that your mothers, that your wives, that your sisters and your daughters are protected from this. This is why our hijab for our women is so that there is a parda, there is a curtain, there is a veil between them and the outside world. The parda is not there to try and increase that beauty, to try and increase or attract more attention. We have to be so careful that these women will be hung from the very breasts that they try and expose. From the legs that they try and show, they will be hung upside down. In another narration, they will be stuck in, in boxes, in, in, in caskets, and the casket will be lowered into the fire. They will be burnt, burnt, burnt through and through. So if they are going to burn, and they are going to the hellfire, they will drag with them all those that are wide-eyed staring at them. It is so difficult. We think it's difficult because 10 days of the year over here we get some sunshine. Hey, But you go to other parts of the world where the sun, sun is shining all year round. So people are constantly in guna. And does it only have to be outside? No, it's happening on the TV. It's happening everywhere you go. Everything's readily available. It's not a problem. So this is why mujahida is so important. The necessity to strive, to struggle and to strive. Then the Prophet ﷺ went on for a little while. Now before that, also, 
the women who used to kill their children. These are the women who end up in extramarital relations or fornicate or whatever they may do and then accidentally say, oh no, I think I'm, I'm expecting, I'm pregnant, or I'm expecting a child. And they abort that child. They terminate that life. For these women as well, without unnecessary reason, the punishment is already waiting. Over here it is again the necessity to purify the eyes, the mouth and the private parts. <sighs> then the Prophet ﷺ went on for a little while. He saw groups of people whose sides were being cut off for meat and they were being eaten. They were being told, eat just as you used to eat the flesh of your brother. Eat it. The Prophet ﷺ said, O oh, Jibreel, who are these? He replied, They are the slanderers of your ummah who bring shame to others. These were the people who used to backbite and lie with it. When something was not true about them, they used to still make up something so that they would be disgraced. People would turn against them. So what will happen to them? They, all of them will be in a group and their sides over here, the flanks will be cut. Meat will be taken off in strips, given to each other. Eat this, eat this, you eat this, you eat this. And they'll be forced to eat and you will chew it and you will swallow it. Why? Because they used to slander people in the community, disgrace other people. And this is what common in our community now. This is common in our environment now. Then the Prophet ﷺ continued for a little while. And he found the consumers of riba and of the property of orphans, the fornicators and adulterers and others in various horrible states like those that have been described above or worse. Then they ascended to the second heaven. This was happening on the first. But again, there's so much more. There is so much more in terms of the punishments that are coming down upon the people. But this is something that we need to understand. The journey of the Prophet wasallam, the Mi'raj, was a journey that the Prophet wasallam went through many stages until he reached the higher stage where the meeting with Allah happened. What we need to understand as well, that where we are, we have a journey. Every individual has a journey from where they are to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We need to go through the different stages. We need to co cover the first stage, the second stage, the third stage, the like the heavens that the Prophet went through. And at every aspect, at every angle, the Prophet met something or another that asked him a question or reminded him of something or tried to distract the Prophet on the, on the Isra part of the journey between Makkah and Jerusalem the Prophet was called by the dunya distracted by the dunya Oh Muhammad come I want to ask you something the Prophet ignored it and he asked Jibreel who is this there was an old woman sitting there he goes Ya Rasulullah this was the dunya had you turned to her, your ummah would have gone astray. And the age of the woman was so, 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 so old. It is narrated that that was an identification of how close the dunya is to coming to an end. The earth, our life on the earth is almost over. The Prophet ﷺ said, that I am the final prophet. Between me and Qiyamah is like this. The difference between the length of the two fingers. Our time is absolutely close now. And since the Prophet ﷺ, 1400 years have passed now. So that's 1400 years less. The other thing also was an old man. Ugly as can be. He called Muhammad, I want to speak to you. And the Prophet ﷺ ignored it. And he said, Jibreel, who was this? He said, this was shaitan. 
He wanted to distract you. Okay? So these things will happen on our journey as well. The journey to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Dunya will come for you. Shaitan will come for you. All sorts of people, all sorts of makhluk will come towards you. But we need to understand our first seven heavens. What are those? What are our first seven heavens? For those that are traveling the path to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Bring your tongue into control. You've taken the first level. Bring your eyes and your tongue into control and you've taken the first two heavens. And then your ears, the third. Your hands, your fourth. Your feet, the fifth. Your stomach, the sixth. Your private part, seven heavens. The person who brings into control his seven organs in itself has achieved a great achievement. Is someone... Shaykh Abdul Qadir Jilani in his book Futu al Ghaib in the 40th discourse he begins with that La Tatman, don't even start to have that desire. Don't even feel like being amongst the pious until your organs have not been purified. We all sit here thinking, yeah, if we were a Shaykh, we'd do this. If we were in pious, we'd do this. And no. You can't even have that want of getting there if your organs are not in the right state, that have not been purified. This is what Allah says in the Quran, Kad aflaha man tazakka. Verily he has succeeded who has purified himself. Our tazkiyah is so important at this stage. And this again from the waqiyah of Mi'raj, that the sorts of people there that are suffering that the Prophet ﷺ saw, all were suffering because of a direct connection to the seven organs that they have. And for every organ that inshallah they bring into their control, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will grant them an extra daraja in paradise inshallah. And this is why it is so important. It is so important that you go back and we start, we have the energy that we need by doing dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, calling upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, linking ourselves spiritually to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and then asking Allah for help. And this is what mujahida is. Our juhud, our struggle, that we ask Allah for help. We make an effort, and we have to pay a price. The price will be what? You might lose your friends. You might have to wake up at night. You might have to wake up early to pray Fajr. You might have to lose some sleep. You might have to go on with less food. You might not have enough money. But ultimately, you will receive what is coming for you, the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We need to understand, in order to walk in the footsteps of the Prophet sallallahu a person that is willing to do that, will surely face difficulty in his life. The Prophet ﷺ said in another narration to the nearest meaning, that towards Yawm Al-Qiyamah, holding on to the deen will be as difficult as holding a piece of burning coal in his hand. How easy is our deen today to follow? How difficult do people find it? How difficult is it for the youth that their own parents cannot trust them that don't go to the mosque because I don't want you to become an extremist. Don't go to the mosque because I don't want this. Don't go to the mosque, I don't want you affiliating with this group or this group or that group. We need to sort our lives out. We need to sort ourselves out. What we need is the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ with spirituality. There are many people that will offer us Quran and Sunnah. Very few will give us the third option of your spiritual connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is what we need. And this is what will take us forward. Your outward appearance, as with anybody, you can fool the world as they walk past you. But if you do not have that connection in your heart to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, 
What a waste. What a wasted life. And this is why we're saying that when you remember Allah, when you try and keep away from sin, what is happening? Your heart is being purified. Your heart is being cleansed. The rust and the sin and the darkness and the veils of darkness that have covered your heart start to dissipate. They start to go away. They start to be cleansed. The heart is cleansed of all the veils, of all the darkness, of the rust. And then it starts to enlighten. It starts to take on the nur from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that I cannot fit, I cannot fit into my creation except into the heart of a believer. Your heart is like a mirror, the Prophet sallallahu said. It has a polish. The polish of it is dhikrullah. And with that dhikr, once your heart has been polished, it becomes like a mirror. The light of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shines in it fully. The example of this, subhanAllah, is can the sun fit into this earth? It can't. The sun cannot. It is so many thousands of times bigger than the size of the earth. But for the person who has a mirror, and he looks into the mirror, to the sun, and the sun will be shown exactly into it, isn't it? This is the same way our heart, once it is cleansed, once it shines, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's light will just enter into it. And before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's light enters into it, you need the light of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa through his sunnah. We get to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa by reading about him, by learning about him, by learning his interaction with people. And the best one is to follow his way, to follow his sunnah. Because it is only when you start to taste the benefits of the behavior from Sunnah will you start to understand and love the Prophet ﷺ. Today someone comes and says to you, here's a thousand pounds, here's ten thousand pounds, all of you ten thousand pounds. How much will you love him? How much will you love this person? You'll think that the sun shines, you know, from, from, from him. Okay? But what about loving that person who gave you the best for this dunya and granted you access to the hereafter. When you realize what the Prophet ﷺ has done for us, then you would not love anyone else except the Prophet ﷺ. He showed us how to live in this life, to benefit from this life, to live a good life, to die with iman, to wake up on the other side happy, and to enter into paradise without any problems. But we do not realize who the Prophet ﷺ is. We do not realize what this life is. We do not realize what death is. We do not realize the time that we are going to spend in our graves. What will that be like? And we don't understand what it will be like when the trumpet is blown. And when we have to stand up in front of Allah and answer for each and every minute detail. Why did you sit like this? Why are you sitting like this? Why did you blink? Why did you... Why? 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 Every little smile, every little wink, every little hair on your body will be questioned. Why did you play with your zip? Everything will be questioned. And this is why the day of judgment 50,000 years long is how long it will take for everyone to answer for everything that they did. Every majlis that you go to, every gathering that you go to, every sitting you go to, you will be asked, why did you sit with these people? Why did I say what I said? Why did you do this? Why did you lift your right foot and then place it in front? Why did you then lift your left foot? Every little step that you take will also be asked about. For the people who put surma in their eyes, the kohal in their eyes, they will be asked, why did you do this? There's a lot to answer for. There is a lot to answer for. And the best thing is that if you don't want to get into trouble, then follow the way of the Prophet wholeheartedly. Allah says in the Quran, Udkhulu fi Enter into Islam completely, not half-heartedly, not on Fridays, not on Eid, not in Ramzan. No, kafa, straight in. 
you just dive in and live in the life of Islam. There's nothing else that you need to worry about thereafter. Because the Prophet ﷺ is Habibullah. He is the beloved of Allah. Allah loves him. Allah loves everything that he does, alayhi salatu wasalam. And anyone that tries to even copy him the slightest is also loved by Allah. It is as simple as that. You know, you see, mashallah, your children or your brothers, that if your friend comes and your friend is, you know, so close to you, even your parents will love that person. Isn't it? You see your, your, your children's friends, you have to love them because they are loving your, your child. When, when you see, you know, anyone respecting your parents, for example, you automatically have love for them as well because they respect someone that you love. But look at this relationship that Allah, the Khalik, the Prophet Sallallahu his Mahboob, anyone that tries to even attain to him, Allah will love you. And this is the love that we have to instill in our hearts. And in these nights, these special nights, these beautiful nights that are coming, spend some time in the remembrance of Allah. And ask Allah for guidance in these nights. Oh Allah, just as you invited the Prophet ﷺ into your closeness, I ask you to allow me to begin my journey to you. Allah, allow me to travel this journey. Allah, allow me to leave my sins behind and allow me to climb these stages of your closeness. It is so important. It is so important. Because again, in a year's time, we'll be sitting in the same place. The same lesson will be given. And we will not have moved anywhere. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us inshallah to allow this to have an effect on ourselves so that we may become better, so that we may be more prepared. As the month of Sha'ban comes in inshallah in the next uh, few days, then this is the, going to be the month of durood on the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Extensively durood. The Prophet said, Sha'ban wa shahri. Sha'ban is my month. So enjoy it. Love it. Give it its due, inshallah, so that we may enter into the month of Ramadan with ease and with peace in our minds, in our hearts. So please, inshallah, increase in your ibadat if you can and increase in your khair and your goodness. And through that, inshallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will grant us his favor and his fadl, his mercy upon us. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala look after all those that are in a less fortunate position than us and bless them all, inshallah. Ameen. الحمد لله وشكر الله الحمد لله رب العالمين الصلاة والسلام على شرف الأنبياء المرسلين اللهم أنت السلام ومنك السلام وإليك يرجع السلام حينا ربنا بالسلام وادخلنا جنة دارك دار السلام تبارك ربنا وتعالي يا ذا الجلال والإكرام اللهم ربنا تقبل منا إنك أنت السميع العليم وتب علينا يا مولانا إنك أنت التواب الرحيم أو الله بيأسك في الله يا الله تبستو يوم ماسي أبانا سيا رحم الرحيمين أنا والله قرأت سيا الله the ability يا الله and the حما يا الله and make it easy يا الله in being able to love you, Ya Arham Ar-Rahimeen, in being able to love your Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, in acting upon his Sunnah, Ya Arham Ar-Rahimeen. And we ask of you, Ya Allah, by the wasila of this blessed night journey that took place, Ya Arham Ar-Rahimeen, that, O oh Allah, you grant us your qurb as well, Ya Arham Ar-Rahimeen. Allow us, Ya Allah, to abandon, Ya Allah, Ya Allah, our life of sin, and to come to you, Ya Allah, in, in a life of ita, Ya Arham Ar-Rahimeen, and itiba, Ya Arham Ar-Rahimeen. O oh Allah, look after us and look after our families, look after our affairs, Ya Arham ar -Rahimeen. And O oh Allah, protect us, Ya Allah, from being any of those who the Prophet ﷺ saw on that night, Ya Arham ar -Rahimeen. O oh Allah, keep us away from those types of people, Ya Arham ar Allah, please, Ya Allah, we ask your forgiveness. And Ya Allah, we ask you to turn us, Ya Allah, away from all that displeases you, Ya Arham ar -Rahimeen. And O oh Allah, to, to face us in the direction, Ya Allah, to walk in that way that will please you and your Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, ya rahman rahimin. Wa sallallahu ala sayyidina mawlana Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa barik wa sallim. Subhana rabbika rabbina izzati amma yasifun wa salamuna ala al-mursaleen. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Bi rahmatika ya rahman rahimin. One question please. Astaghfirullah. Whatever the shit that people...